biblical prophecy shall be fulfilled before our eyes. This man took the mark of the beast, and everything changed. Imagine the near future, in a world that has accepted the rule of the man that is the Antichrist. Under his rule, Nick, a middle-income man, struggles to shop at stores or sell any of his wares. He goes through all these troubles because he has yet to accept the mark. However, he does not want to be like any of the outcasts. The outcasts are a group of people that have decided to stand against the Antichrist because they do not accept his mark or bow down to his image. These outcasts have a challenging existence as they have to stay hidden. After much consideration, Nick finally succumbs and decides to take the mark. It is an easy process. The prophet of the Antichrist has made it all too easy. After he accepts his mark, he knows that he has finally taken a stand, a stand against the God of the outcasts, the Jesus that they serve. Now, he is ready to get all the benefits of this decision. However, something strange begins to happen. The world starts experiencing several disasters, from floods to earthquakes. Now, a strange disaster falls. This disaster affects his hand. The spot at which he took the mark suddenly becomes painful and oozing a foul smell. It turns into an awful sore. There is no one to help. All peoples that took the mark are writhing in pain. They are confused people, but some are not perplexed because they know the truth. The outsiders know the real truth. The outcasts notice these happenings too. They know that this is not a result of a global attack or war. In fact, these outcasts hold the real truth and have also picked a side. Although they have suffered, they know the truth. They know this Antichrist is a leader who wants to replace Jesus. He had an attempted execution and got miraculously healed, and everyone fell for him. So many follow his every word and command. They also know that these sores that Nick and the others are going through is not from this world, but from a headquarters far away from them. These afflictions come from the temple of God far away in heaven. The temple of God in heaven is a mysterious place. Many people do not even know that there is a temple in heaven. This particular temple is opened in Revelation chapter 11. However, when it is closed, it signals an intense warning and judgment on the entire world, the worst the world has ever seen or will ever see. It would be the final judgment on the world. When the temple is first opened, a lot of mysterious things happen. First, the Ark of the Covenant is rediscovered. This particular depiction is actually a truth yet to be revealed. For example, Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. And the temple of God which is in heaven was opened, and the Ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. However, everything is about to change. Seven angels appear in the temple and change everything. After these things I look, and the temple sanctuary of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues, afflictions, calamities, came out of the temple arrayed in linen, pure and gleaming, and wrapped around their chests were golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath and indignation of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory and radiance and splendor of God and from his power. 
and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Revelation chapter 15 verses 5 through 8. However, this is not a judgment that is taken lightly by heaven. In the previous chapter, we saw how serious and important the preparation was for pouring the bowls. These angels are bringing God's judgment. It's important to note that they came straight from the heavenly temple, from God's presence and throne. They are not acting on their own. They even wear special clothing. They wear pure, bright linen with their chest girded with golden bands. This clothing reminds us that although judgments are terrible, they come from a righteous source. It is easy to think that unpleasant judgments only come from evil sources. This shows us the very opposite. There will be a significant judgment on the earth, and nobody can do anything about this judgment because it comes from a righteous God. Yes, the Bible does mention evil angels who have caused and will cause chaos and destruction, but that's not the case here. The Bible is clear that these angels are righteous and not fallen. These angels are given bowls, and the temple is filled with the cloud of God's glory. During this period, it's important to understand that those who don't believe may not realize the impending judgment. This also illustrates that things first manifest in the spiritual realm before becoming apparent in the physical world. Man can detect rain and wind patterns, but God's ways are different. There is no scientific procedure to understand the workings of God's temple. We only know about these mysteries because God has shared them with his children. We can find comfort in this knowledge. Many Christians do not realize that they already have answers that the world seeks, including how it will all end. The order of heaven is simply excellent. One of the four living creatures close to God's throne gives these bowls to these seven angels. The four living creatures John sees are full of eyes and have different forms. A lion, an ox, a human, and an eagle. This proves that these judgments come from the very throne of God. When this judgment starts, no one is even allowed to enter the temple of God. This shows that heaven does not take this judgment lightly. There is no stopping this judgment as soon as it begins. Heaven is ready, the temple is closed, the seven angels are ready, and man is ready to take these bowls. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath and indignation of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and loathsome and malignant sores came on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Revelation chapter 16 verses 1 through 2. A voice comes from the temple. Is this the voice of Jesus? In Revelation, heavenly voices often represent Christ, but not always. Since the wicked have mistreated the earthly temple, judgment now comes from the heavenly temple. These bowls focus more on human rebellion and judge more areas than other judgments did. Most of the bowls, like the trumpets, remind us of the plagues from the Exodus. Painful sores, turning water into blood, and darkness. By reminding us of these plagues, these judgments show us that just as God protected his people in Goshen during the plagues, he will also protect them from his judgments. The last two bowls represent the final battle and the completion of God's promises. The first bowl brings painful and harmful sores to those who worship the image and have the mark of the beast. People who choose to follow God are not affected by this bowl. It's only for those who follow the Antichrist. This passage shows God's anger being poured out on humanity, which was created on the sixth day. Genesis chapter 1. Revelation chapter 13 verse 18 
tells us this represents the sixth Egyptian plague of boils that hits those with the 666 mark of the beast, those who worship the creature instead of the Creator. The Second Bowl Revelation chapter 16, verse 3 The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. Earlier, a third of the sea's life was gone, and now with this bowl, the rest is gone. The oceans are lifeless. God's anger is shown in the ocean. Fish were a fantastic food source when God created the waters on the fifth day. But now with a second bowl, the ocean's blessing is destroyed. Just like in the sixth plague, where Egypt's waters turned to blood and caused death for the Egyptians, the ocean now brings death. With the third bowl, the rivers and springs turn to blood. Revelation chapter 16 verses 4 through 7. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you, the one who is and who was, O Holy One, because you judged these things, for they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. The third bowl turns all the fresh water into blood. God is showing his judgment by saying that the wicked people on earth have spilled the blood of believers, and now they will drink this themselves. This third bowl reminds us of how the Nile River turned to blood during the first plague in Egypt. The plague of water turning to blood happens again to make a strong point, showing that God's judgment is right. The Jewish people thought that different angels were in charge of different parts of nature, while Greeks thought gods or spirits were in charge. In this case, the angel in charge of the waters praises God's fairness because the waters have turned to blood. The praise from the angels and the altar is a major part of these judgments, adding to what we've already heard from the trumpet judgments. They talk about God's fairness and holiness, which ties back to the Song of Moses that also talks about God's judgments. The reason for recognizing God's fairness and holiness here is because you have so judged. The altar shows that God is fair and just. It's clear because it holds the prayers of the faithful, whether it's the altar where sacrifices are made or the altar of incense. That's why it plays a part in God's judgments. The Scorching Sun Revelation chapter 16 verses 8 through 9 And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given power to scorch people with fire. And the people were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. In the fourth bowl, the sun becomes extremely hot and burns people, making them curse God. Even though they suffer, they still don't change their ways or praise God. Very few people who curse God actually start to repent and give Him glory during this time. The sun was meant to light up the day, while the moon and stars light up the night. Now the sun, which was a source of life, is being used as a tool of death. Darkness Revelation chapter 16 verses 10 through 11 And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. This bowl makes the Antichrist realm dark, but even with the darkness, people still curse God and refuse to change their sinful ways. 
The darkness surrounds the wicked instead of burning them like the sun. It's similar to the last plague in Egypt, where darkness covered the land for three days and no one could see or move. Jesus calls hell the outer darkness where people will cry and grind their teeth in pain. Matthew chapter 25 verse 30 The plagues of burning sun and darkness remind us of the Old Testament plague on Egypt's sun god Amun-Ra and other events from the Exodus. The darkness actually causes pain. Instead of seeing this as God's justice and repenting, people only get angrier at God and continue to curse Him. War Revelation chapter 16 verses 12 through 16 The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the entire world, to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes, so that he will not walk about naked, and people will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddo. In the sixth bowl, the huge Euphrates River dries up, making it easier for the kings from the east to come. The drying up of the river also helps the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet trick the most powerful leaders. They are getting ready for the big final battle against Jesus, known as Armageddon. Armageddon is mentioned specifically only once in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Despite its singular mention, the concept has taken on significant importance in our thought and imagination. Did you know that Armageddon is derived from the Hebrew Har Megiddo? Har meaning mountain and Megiddo, which altogether means mountain of Megiddo. Megiddo itself is a historical site located in modern day Israel, known for its strategic importance and as a place of numerous ancient battles. However, in the context of Revelation, Armageddon is not just a physical location but symbolically represents the final battle between the forces of good and evil before the end of the world. When people hear the word Armageddon, they often think of big world-ending events. The name makes people think of a big fight between good and bad, and is often used in movies and books to talk about the world ending. But this name actually comes from old stories and places from a long time ago in the Middle East. The connection between the apocalyptic Armageddon and the historical Megiddo is profound. This name wasn't picked randomly for the end times battle. It has a lot of history tied to that area's past troubles. Megiddo was an ancient city located at a strategic crossroad in northern Israel, which connected the vital trade routes of Egypt to the south and Mesopotamia to the north. This geographical significance meant that whoever controlled Megiddo had a distinct advantage, both economically and militarily. Because of its strategic importance, the city became a focal point for many battles over the centuries. Notably, the Bible recounts one of the earliest recorded battles at Megiddo, where the renowned judge of Israel, Deborah, and her general Barak, triumphed over the Canaanite King Jabin and his commander Sisera in Judges chapter 5. In the ancient lands of Israel, Megiddo wasn't just any place. It was a crucial crossroad, a place where many battles happened. One of the most memorable battles there involved a fearless woman named Deborah and her loyal general Barak. And so at Megiddo, 
through the faith and bravery of Deborah, Barak, and Jael, the Israelites saw the power of God at work, bringing them victory against overwhelming odds. Given its history as a battleground, it's not surprising that the prophetically inclined authors of the New Testament would draw upon Megiddo's legacy as a metaphor for the ultimate confrontation between good and evil. Its history is filled with battles and fights, which makes it a good symbol for the big final battle talked about in the book of Revelation. However, this is not the end. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 In Revelation chapter 20, history as we know it is over at this point, and John begins to describe the eternal state in which believers will dwell. Unbelievers will exist in an eternal state that has already been described. Believers will live in a new heaven and a new earth, because the first heaven and first earth will pass away. Revelation chapter 21 verses 2 through 4 And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will live among them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be death. There will no longer be sorrow and anguish or crying or pain, for the former order of things has passed away. Right now, Jesus lives in a beautiful city in heaven with all the people who believed in him and have passed away. In the future, during a special thousand-year time, God's people will live and work on the earth we know today, with their main city in Jerusalem. But after God makes the earth new by destroying the old one, He will bring that heavenly city down to the new earth, all ready and shining like a bride for her wedding. That city will be known as the New Jerusalem and will serve as the capital of the new creation. And there, in the midst of his new creation, God will dwell and live with his people. As we live alongside our Creator, all sadness, hurt, and disappointment will be gone. The idea that God will make everything new may appear too fantastic to be true, but he claims that this promise is faithful and true. His people will be completely satisfied in the new creation, which is symbolized here by the metaphor of thirst being quenched from the spring of life's water. When you're thirsty, the refreshing satisfaction of downing a cold glass of water pales in comparison to the spectacular satisfaction that awaits you. Every saved person will live in the new creation, but the Christian who is fully committed, the one who conquers, will inherit an even greater reward and God will dwell with him with greater intimacy, as a father does with his son. The description of heaven is interrupted by a brief reminder that those who continue to sin and rebel against God will spend eternity in the lake of fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Unbelievers, with their unglorified bodies and unredeemed souls, will enter a place where all of their problems from this life will be magnified with no hope of improvement. They will be imprisoned in the consequences of their sinfulness to varying degrees. Although believers will live throughout the new creation, the angel directs John's attention to the capital of the new earth. This city will shine brighter than a cut diamond because it will be adorned with God's glory. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, 
for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Revelation chapter 21 verses 23 through 26. There will be no need for the sun or moon in the city, because the glory of God will illuminate it, and the lamp will be the Lamb. Our sun is 93 million miles away, but its power is enough to illuminate the earth. God's presence, on the other hand, can easily replace the sun because the Lord possesses even greater power and radiance. The fact that there will never be night there implies that believers' glorified bodies will never tire and need to sleep. Furthermore, we will not become bored. On the new earth, Nations and kings will function in a national context, bringing their glory and honor into the city. Everyone will visit the New Jerusalem as the pinnacle of their lives on the New Earth. And why not, given its magnificence? Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. While the invitation to dwell in this city is universal, the requirements to enter are specific. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who have accepted Jesus as their Savior by faith. The book of Revelation is not just a bunch of facts. It's a special message from God to get us ready for the end times. The whole point is to prepare us. Lots of people study prophecies about the end times just to learn more. But God wants us to be ready for the challenges we'll face as the world gets tougher and as Jesus is about to return. So, let me be clear. It's very important for us to study Revelation because it's close to God's heart. He wants us to be ready to meet Him. Revelation talks about amazing things God will do on earth before Jesus comes back. Then it describes Jesus' return. And finally, it shows us the new heavens and the new earth. Let's start from the beginning. John is on the island of Patmos because he believed in Jesus and they wanted to keep him away from everyone so he wouldn't keep talking about Jesus. So there he is, alone on this island. The book of Revelation starts by saying that on a Sunday, while John was alone, he heard a voice from heaven. He was suddenly taken to the spirit world and saw Jesus on his throne. Jesus spoke to him through angels and showed him what would happen on earth in the last days. John saw Jesus open a scroll with seals on it, and as Jesus opened it, judgments began to come down on the earth. In total, John saw 21 judgments that Jesus would bring on the earth in the last days. Listen up, everyone. Don't get bogged down by all the details. Just get the main idea. There are 21 judgments, and they come in three stages. First, there are seven judgments called the seven seals. Next, we have seven more judgments that come with seven trumpets. Finally, there are the last seven judgments, which are known as the seven bowls of wrath. So to recap, first, seven seals are broken, then seven trumpets are blown, and when the seventh trumpet sounds, it brings on the seven bowls of wrath. Before the seventh trumpet blows and the bowls of wrath are poured out, something amazing happens. The church is taken off the earth. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is called the Lamb of God 29 times. This is really important to understand. I know some of this might be a review for you, but it's crucial as we start this new series on understanding Revelation. The Bible is all about unity. The Old Testament and the New Testament go together. The New Testament doesn't replace the Old Testament, but completes it. 
the same patterns from the Old Testament show up in the New Testament. For example, think about Joseph. He was rejected by his brothers, but later became their savior. Just like Jesus, who was rejected by Israel, but became its savior. We can see many patterns from the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament. That's why Jesus said, he didn't come to get rid of the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So with Jesus being called the Lamb of God 29 times in Revelation, we should ask ourselves what this means. While Jesus is also called the offspring of David and the bright and morning star in Revelation, he is mostly referred to as the Lamb. Since the Old and New Testaments are connected, we see this in the first chapter of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, where it talks about Jesus' family history. This shows us that Jesus is linked to the Old Testament. Jesus is called the Lamb, so we need to understand what this means. To find out, we go back to the Old Testament, specifically to Exodus chapter 12. There we learn that Israel was freed from Egypt by the blood of a lamb. Jesus' mission is similar. He brings the deliverance of Israel to its ultimate end by saving all of God's people, both Jews and Gentiles from the world and Satan, and bringing them to heaven through his blood. When Jesus was first introduced to the world by John the Baptist at the Jordan River, John pointed at him and said, Look, the Lamb of God. Jesus was introduced as the Lamb, and at the end of everything in the book of Revelation, he is also seen as the Lamb. Peter told us that we have been saved and bought for God by the precious blood of the Lamb. Paul told us that Christ has become our Passover. So, knowing that Jesus fulfills the Exodus story from the Torah, by becoming the lamb who buys God's children out of the world for himself, we must interpret the book of Revelation, which shows Jesus as the lamb through the Passover story and Exodus. So when we think about God pouring out his judgment on the Egyptians, remember this. Listen up, everyone. When we read about how God sent judgments on the Egyptians in the book of Exodus, we might wonder where God's people were during that time. Where was Israel when God sent the ten plagues on Egypt? Well, they were in Egypt too. Even though God protected them, they still felt the impact of the plagues. This is important because it shows us what will happen again at the end of time. The same thing will happen with the first seven seals and the first six trumpets. Then, when the seventh trumpet sounds, God will take his people out of the world. After that, he will pour out his final wrath. Just like he did with Egypt, where he released his final wrath by drowning them in the sea, God first took Israel out of Egypt. He did this by parting the sea, which is like the rapture. God moved them supernaturally to the other side, and then he drowned the Egyptians in that same sea. All right, let's break it down. Israel in the book of Exodus is like the church today. Egypt in Exodus stands for the world. Just as Israel was in Egypt, the church will be in the world while God's judgments are coming down, but we will be saved. Pharaoh in Exodus is like Satan. The false signs and wonders that Pharaoh's magicians showed in front of Moses are like the fake supernatural events that will happen at the end of time. This will happen both in the world and through false prophets and teachers who might try to sneak into the church. The New Testament warns us about many lies and fake wonders at the end of time. Jesus warned in Matthew chapter 24, Be careful of false teachers and prophets. He said that the tricks and deceptions at the end of time will be so powerful that even the most faithful might be tricked. We can see this in the Old Testament when Pharaoh's magicians threw their staffs on the ground and they turned into snakes. These were fake signs and wonders. Also, 
the ten plagues that God sent on Egypt in the book of Exodus, will be repeated during the Great Tribulation. For instance, we'll see the waters turn to blood again, and there will be a plague of frogs, which are symbols of evil spirits, just like in ancient Egypt. But don't be scared. Jesus told us that when these things happen, we should not fear, but instead be happy and look up because our salvation is near. However, we need to be ready. We shouldn't think that we will never face tough times, because if we think that way, and I'm right about the troubles to come, we won't be ready. That's why Jesus gave us the book of Revelation and told us to build our lives on Him, like building a house on a strong rock. When hard times come, we 